Hi, everyone. Welcome to Business First Wednesday uh, for our, what month are we in now? November program. Oh, my goodness. Um, today is part three of a three-part series on financial wellness. We're going to be talking about financial wellness for your small business <clears throat> with our wonderful, wonderful Andrea Colleen from Consumer Credit Counseling Service of Rochester. Uh, but first, I want to introduce our uh, partner, Gina Mangiamelli, with the Small Business Development Center, uh, and she's going to kick us off. Gina? Hi, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, <clears throat> this series has been a tremendous amount of information that everyone can use. And if you weren't able to make the first two, they are on the, U, uh, the library's YouTube channel. So you can get part one and part two and eventually part three when it gets loaded up. So the Small Business Development Center partners with the Business Insights Center because it's a great match for uh, information and resources that you need as a business owner. The Small Business Development Center, we're SUNY Brockport, but we're only one of 22 centers in New York State, one of 1,057 nationwide. We're the largest technical service provider for entrepreneurs uh, in the country. We do help with business plan development, all the things you need to know about starting your business. We can help you with loan assistance, organizational structures, workshops like this, seminars, and uh, everything from procurement, construction, contracting, we have publications, we have a research network. So if you're not familiar with the SBDC, we encourage you to uh, check out our website, which we'll put in the chat. And uh, hopefully if you need assistance with your small business that you register and uh, get in here so that we can have you work with our certified business advisors who are well-equipped to help whatever uh, challenges you may be facing. So with that, uh, I'm very excited about defeating debt as a business owner. This is something we face at the SBDC every day uh, with clients who may not have the greatest credit score or even know how to check out their credit score. So we're very happy and thankful for uh, Consumer Credit Counseling of Rochester so that they can help us with these kinds of um, things that people need to know about. So Andrea, why don't you kick it off and get us going? All right. Well, thank you so much, Gina. It's really great to see everyone. And thank you, Jennifer, as well. Um, <clears throat> my name is Andrea Colleen, and I work at Consumer Credit Counseling Service um, as an education and outreach coordinator. And the role that um, I play in the organization is doing fun things like this, getting out in the community, uh, making awareness of the different programs and services that we offer, um, and offering different financial topics when it pertains to money. And I feel like everything <laughs> pertains to money or finances or debt. So our focus today is for us uh, as business owners, small business owners, aspiring business owners, and our focus will be mostly on, on debt, managing debt, strategies to resolve the debt. We're just going to have a conversation, uh, a little bit of an activity uh, to talk about what we think can get us into debt, especially when we own a business. And we'll focus in on that. And at the end, we'll talk a little bit about some of the programs that we offer here um, to be able to assist people. As far as questions go, um, usually Jennifer watches the chat box for me and I'll stop periodically um, to try to answer a few questions at a time, usually after at the end of each section. Um, but this is, you know, an interactive workshop. So please feel free to ask those questions um, either out loud during those times or type them in the chat. And, and then um, hopefully we'll have some time for more discussion at the end. So like I said, our focus is defeating debt as a business owner. Uh, I always start off, if you've done these workshops, by explaining who we are, just so you know where we're coming from. Uh, we have been, uh, CCCS, or Consumer Credit Counseling Service of Rochester, has been in the area for over 50 years, uh, and we are very proud to be here in the Rochester area, though our agency can serve people throughout the state and beyond um, if, you know, when they're looking for that type of support. Um, and we are a nonprofit agency. I think I mentioned that. <laughs> so our focus is on the financial health of individuals and families, helping those that we serve to achieve financial wellness through the different programs and services that we offer. So on this side of it is financial education and outreach. That's what, kind of what we're doing today. Uh, but on the other side of it is we offer a lot of one-on-one -on -one style um, counseling sessions, which I'll, which I'll cover at the end. So we are a member of the National Foundation for Credit Counseling. I'm going to type that link in the chat box because this um, 
website has a lot of resources um, and they've added, re let me, NFCC dot, I believe it's the org. Um, the National Foundation for Credit Counseling is the name of the organization, but they do have a lot of resources, uh, new resources for small business owners, education, blogs, um, articles, things like that, ways to get connected to help because we, uh, you know, we do that as well. We're also licensed by the New York State Department of Financial Services, and we are a HUD-approved housing counseling agency. So we can help people with their finances, whether it comes to managing debts, credits, all that stuff, education. But we also can help people um, with delinquent mortgages, uh, delinquent rent, things like that through our counseling and first-time homebuyer programming. And we are a member of the Better Business Bureau with an A-plus rating. So here's how I kind of sectioned things off um, today to talk. We're going to talk a little bit about how it could become a problem. And it means debt <laughs> and creating the right uh, mindset. So we're going to talk about a little bit like strategies to, to, to help us, you know, think about, think, not just mathematically organize our finances, but like just think about like how we can prepare our mind to manage these debts uh, or finances in general. And then some more statistical strategies that really help people to pay debt off, maybe accelerate those repayments, understand certain things when it comes to repaying debts. Uh, and then we'll open it up for, well, then I'll talk about a few more resources and we'll open it up for some questions and discussion. So I wanted to start off because for most business owners, of course, our first priority is, is usually our business. Uh, but if we truly want to run the business at full capacity, it's really important to get our personal and professional, but our focus today is more personal, debt under control. A lot of times we don't, and I, I say this in a lot of, to my, when we're doing the business um, workshops, is that our business you know, is, is very important. There's a lot of work that goes into creating. There's a lot of work that goes into sustaining. And sometimes we forget about our personal side of things. Um, the, the purpose really behind our business, uh, obviously, is to do what we love doing. But one of the main purposes is to generate an income. And yes, yeah, so though we may be generating an income, if we we need to put ourselves first and develop that plan of how we're going to manage that income appropriately. It's a little bit more challenging for business owners, especially if we're not organized or if we are not um, focusing on financial goals and preparing for, you know, setbacks and things like that. Um, and it could be wonderful too, because we know we could, there's definitely opportunity to, you know, have a, a wonderful income and do what we love doing, but it's really important to, understand where we're starting. So I know on the call, we have people that may already have businesses. We have people that are looking to start a business, but our focus is really on making sure our personal financial situation is, is okay, where it needs to be. Here. Oh, okay. Oh, if we could out, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, you know, just making sure that things are where um, we need to be. So let's start a chat discussion. What we'll type these in the chat. Um, how do we do? Does personal debt become a problem for business owners? So I'll wait and see if I see a few responses. We'll read those out loud. I'll talk about what we've seen over the years uh, at Consumer Credit Counseling because we do counsel a lot of people who have their own business and are generating their own income. So um, we what, we could type them in the chat and then we can have a discussion. Okay, wonderful. I see a few things there. Very right. Yes, perfect. Wonderful. And, and how do we think we got the credit score, which I think does pertain to more debt stress it causes yeah yeah like how do we think that um business owners might be more prone to having debt yeah wonderful so we see brand new graduates with no assets impacts financial opportunities for business we, we had some word on credit rating and credit score income to debt ratio need cash to operate yes that's a big one right that we don't always realize we have to kind of depend on our ourselves 
anyone else? Okay, you can still keep popping those in there. I'll read them off. I'm going to put a few common scenarios that uh, we've experienced, you know, that over the years. Sometimes we don't always have good control over personal finances because we're so focused in on the business itself that we could set those to the side or a plan for business expenses. And we can start to commingle business funds or lack thereof funds. Somebody put that in there. I mean, that makes perfect sense, especially in the early days. We might not be generating an income um, and, and we might be relying on credit card debt, right? Or using debt or loans or things like that. Um, it can, when we start to commingle, it can confuse things. We can start to think we are making more profit than we are. Uh, maybe there's tax concerns or tax responsibilities. Uh, and that's why it's, you know, it's good to seek out those resources to help you with that business plan and the budget and all of that. That's a big one that we've seen people experience when they come to consumer credit. They may have a business, but they have unwanted debts or unexpected debts because they needed to pay their taxes and they weren't like aware of, um, you know, how much those things could be. All right, I'm just going to turn that off. They could be taking too little or too much for personal income, this, I don't, uh, so what we see, and I don't know, maybe you've seen this too or experienced this or know people have is that sometimes people could be, uh, you know, not taking enough income and using, you know, that their business generates and they might be leaning on credit too much in, in creating debt from that. And sometimes, I know this might sound kind of weird, but like, I don't know. I don't know. I've been always been under like the impression that, you know, if someone is self-employed or they own a business and you could type if you agree or not, but people think that if you have a business, you have a lot of money, <laughs> you know, or you have a lot of income, which of course could be true. Of course could be true, but we might, there, there might be more pressure on things to take care of a check or to pay for this or to do for that, you know, some more expectations on that. So sometimes we could be taking out too much income to cover those expenses and getting in debt because of it. I've known a lot of people professionally and personally who have experienced that. Um, and, and it's hard. It might be hard to figure out, like, how much can I take of this for my income? So a business is not sustaining and we're using our personal assets to afford expenses. You know, that's pretty normal in the beginning. But over time, you know, it's, it's important to check in with those numbers, check in with those expenditures, uh, especially on both sides of things to make sure that it's working. It's sometimes it's hard to real to admit if it's not. Sometimes it's overwhelming to you know make those changes or you know whatnot. But again, this is just reasons that we might see someone coming into that debt because of it. Um, another thing, and I see a question. I was going to go through these two last bullets here, but uh, the adequate medical insurance. That's an, a thing for um, business owners if the medical insurance isn't covering. Um, enough of what they need, or maybe it's a higher cost insurance and there's higher cost, you know, co-payments and things like that. People can get overwhelmed with that. And that could throw someone off and starting to lean on debt and, or should I say credit and loans um, or not having enough personal savings, but that's for anyone really, I guess. So those are just some things that um, just to kind of pop in our mind to try to, you know, have us aware of. Um, and then, okay, great, Gina. You can always say this too, but it, I'll read it. But it says, usually business owners underestimate the cost of production and operations. I agree. I, I guess that is what I probably try to put in here that you worded it better. But yeah, we could underestimate the cost. And then we think we might have more income and we're basing our personal expenses on what we think we may have coming in. So there is a go, there is a balance. I'm not trying to like, just look at the downside of things. I just wanted to kind of, think about like what could create unwanted, you know, or unmanageable debt, you know, for business owners. So thank you for taking part in that. And then we'll talk about all the fun stuff too. So no worries. <laughs> so overall, I, I, I received the statistics from um, Statista, I can't, Statista.com. And they said the overall impact of COVID-19 on small businesses in the U.S., and this was as of April of 2022. So we know that the pandemic did have an impact on a lot of businesses. Um, most of it was moderately negative impact. You could see at 43.9, some, there was some small percentages that had a positive impact, but there's 
you know, 21% where people, of people had a large impact. It looks like there's definitely or a large negative impact. So we know that um, that was a big issue, you know, for many businesses when trying to sustain, depending on the size, depending on what type of work we're doing. But that is a big reason too. That's, that's one of the reasons that our organization has established um, the kind of counseling that we do for specifically for small business owners. And I'll talk a little bit about that, but that just helps people to, you know, stay um, good with their personal expenses or organized with their personal expenses, specifically when it comes to debt. I mean, of course, the budgeting piece and the savings and all that. um, But especially when it comes to debt, if someone's feeling overwhelmed, we want to be able to help someone resolve those, you know, and and we, we, we receive special training and all of this great uh, resources for people who own businesses. So that's kind of the impact that the pandemic has. Now I want to do another little brief activity, and then we'll get into more of the the logistical stuff. But according to consumerfinance.gov, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that website. If you're not, you know, copy the link. I'll, I'll send the slides so you'll have all the active links. But if you're not, this is a fantastic resource for anyone when it comes to managing personal finances. It can educate us prior to getting specific type of loans, mortgages. It can help people if they have the you know fraudulent activity or uh, trying to reduce the risk of identity theft. So we'll go through a little bit of a, a resource with them. Um, so they developed a 10 question um, evaluation to help you measure where you are financially. So knowing your financial well-being. So with financial well-being, the CFPB determines that those that assess and support an employee's uh, complete or their own complete financial picture and overall financial health of an individual, right? So that's just kind of where where we are. So they developed this evaluation and I'll put the link um, in the chat to where we could take it. And I'll still keep talking, but we could take a minute to fill that out. And it just kind of lets us think about like, not just how well we are at math <laughs> and managing money in that respect, but just about how well we feel, how good do we feel of, like if an emergency happens or what kind of choices uh, we might make when when we're like stuck, you know what I mean? So it's got a few questions there. So I'm just going to Bear with me one second. I'm going to pop this in the chat box. So they'll, the link hopefully should work. And while we're talking, oh no, I hope it does. Does it work? You know what? Let me do it like this. Maybe I'll just copy the link. If you take it out of the parentheses and do www, it should, I'll, I'll do it. Thanks. Sometimes it, it says just copy link. Nope. You're, oh, there you go. There, there you one. go. There you go. It's all about the link. So, <laughs> so, um, yeah. So if you want to take a minute and, and look through that, I think it's, I don't know, I like this tool and I think it's really helpful and it does kind of get us thinking. And at the end, it will make some recommendations. I believe it will also give some resources um, to help if people need help in certain areas. But I think like one of the first starting points, when we talk about debt, we talk about managing money. I don't know if anyone did any of the other workshops, but is to really get our mind right, is to really create, like, where do I stand? Where do I think? I don't have to be in the same spot as someone else. It's okay for me to, you know, spend money the way I do, and it's okay for them to do it the way they do, or save, or establish credit. But I think it's a really important concept and a really important step for us to know, you know, where we are beginning and where we are starting. So feel free to take that. None of the results are shared. It is um, on you know, it's, it's only shared with you. It's not saved in any website. It's not saved in any links. It's really just designed to help us kind of see where we stand. Um, I think the average score is like 54% because it will give you like a percentage based. Uh, but I thought that might be a fun little activity. And you, and you could keep on going. I'll keep on moving along through the slides just to keep ourselves on time. But I thought that could be a good start. 
So we talked about how how people can get into debt or have unwanted debts or whatnot as a business owner. Cause I think that, you know, there's more opportunities in, in some regard for lending and there's more opportunities for earning, of course, but let's just talk a little bit about how it can become a problem. So I want to start off by saying when it comes to debt, it's basically money that we owe, right? And not all debt is bad debt. I mean, we need to utilize credit at some point to create a credit score. I, we did a whole workshop on that last time. You could check that out on YouTube. We'll generate a little bit of those concepts in throughout this workshop too. But, um, you know, using credit can help us to build not just our personal credit, but our business credit as well. So if it's used properly, it can help us to obtain things that we need to support ourselves and to really improve our wealth, whether it's personal wealth or business, if it's used appropriately. So when, when, it, when it comes to debt and when it comes to using credit, when we really are in check with the way we manage money, the goals that we have, you know, being mindful about the debt we have and really understanding, like knowing who we owe, knowing what kind of interest rates we're receiving, knowing if we're current or we're not, you know, those are a few questions that we can ask ourselves. Um, but again, it's not, it's not always a bad thing. Pitfalls that we see people coming into um, is using credit cards for anything other than convenience, of course, or emergencies. I mean, of course, we're going to use credit, you know, as, as needed. But if we start establishing too much of a habit, that can be a challenge. I would say, over the, this is something I've learned just over the years. Like, if you've been paying the same balance for more than two to three years, it's time to reevaluate. I think we have to reevaluate every six months, probably every month, really. What, where do my, what am I spending? Where's my money going? What goals do I have? How am I, you know, staying on track? What kind of, you know, debts do I have? And my, where's my score? All that good stuff. But I just wanted to kind of put that out there because I know just through the counseling that we've done, and I'm just speaking from the experiences that we've had for years, that sometimes people don't really recognize that because their credit scores, oh, my credit score is okay or whatnot. But if you've been paying that same debt, it doesn't mean it has to be at that same place, right? We could have moved those balances over. We could have gotten lower interest rates. We could have did this or that to, you know, get those balances where they need to be. You know, even if the rates are not bad, if it's the same amount of debt over two to three years, we need to pull back and figure out what can I do? Because even if it's at 1% interest, if we've been paying that same $10,000, you know, creditor debt for 10 years, the amount of interest that we've paid on that, even at a low percentage is substantial. So that could be a car, that could be a couple cars. So when we're using them for anything other than those purposes, we might be pulled into that. Another pitfall is just the convenience and ease of use of credit, overspending, I just put overspending online, but using apps, you know, when we have things stored, that can cause us to spend more money than we thought. And it's really easy. It's easy to buy things now, much easier than it was 10, 20 years ago. We don't even need the card half the time. You could just bring your phone. If you have your phone, maybe that should be it. <laughs> if we have a, a smartphone, that will make you spend more money because it does. Um, recurrent fees coming out of bank accounts. That's another thing. I, I don't know if we've experienced that, you know, or if you know what I'm speaking of, that's the continuous NSF fees, not just because we bounced a check because, because that's kind of what we might think of, but because we went a few dollars over and now our, you know, overdraft kicked in or it didn't. And now there's a fee here or there. The average amount of money that someone pays on average um, throughout our nation is about $200 a year in overdrawn fees. That's probably about five or six, because you depending on how much it is, five or six times a year overdrawing a bank account. So that can be a pitfall that can throw our money off whack that can cause us to start using credit to, you know, balance it out with intentions of getting ahead of it, but it can get overwhelming. Getting a, a mortgage or a car loan that's too expensive can throw us off, of course. You know, any big obligations like that. Um, other things like retroactive interest, very high interest rates. So retroactive interest is when you um, maybe get like a 0% for a year, but then after that year, if it's not paid off, all of the interest from the initial original balance will 
be applied. So just watch out for things like that, um, because that could be a little bit tricky. And that that's usually with like store cards or maybe like a furniture card. But it could happen when we transfer balances. You know, you, you have an intention to transfer a balance to get a lower interest rate. But if it's not paid off within a specific amount of time, sometimes the entire amount of interest will accumulate. So we have to read that fine print. So again, I'll get into the debt part, but these are some reasons and some common um, pitfalls that people experience that wish they wish I knew ahead of time. So let's talk about debt stress <coughs> and how honestly that can almost get us to spend more money, <laughs> cause us to spend more money because we're stressed out. And how do we alleviate stress? We have fun. And how do we have fun? We spend money. No. <laughs> so here's some of the... Um, the stages. So again, I'm not saying this is all of us. I feel, I honestly do feel like though, just in my experience at consumer credit, that I feel like most people have experienced in their life at some point, maybe on several occasions, being overwhelmed with managing finances or debt. I feel like sometimes those experiences can make us better, you know, at managing things and learning from those. Um, well, let's talk about stages. So these stages can apply to anything that, you know, this is, this is really the grieving process. So in our, our workshop today, we're grieving over debt. <laughs> so let's talk about the first stage of denial. This is a real thing. And I don't know if anybody, again, can connect with this or not, not that we have to say that out loud, but denial might be, you know what, I don't owe that much money. You know, I might be paying debt. Maybe I see my credit score go up and down. I don't think I owe that much. And then going back and feeling, oh, wow, I do owe more than I thought. Underestimating how much we owe, underestimating how much we spent, you know, underestimating how much we think our interest rates are, not answering the phone if, if you get a call, like a collection call, um, you know, leaving, not looking at your mail. That's a big one right there. That That's a big one. You know, not looking at the statements because we were scared. We don't want to know what the balances are. We don't want to know what we're spending. It's like not getting on the scale <laughs> type of thing, but leaving bills unopened, right? Keep opening new accounts, you know, to sustain. Uh, once one is maxed out, telling yourself that everybody's in debt. This is the normal way of living. You know, those are stages of denial. So when it comes to credit or debt, like we could be experiencing the, these, these symptoms. I don't even know the right word to say, but uh, if we feel like we might be in this stage, maybe it's time to reevaluate. People can be here for a matter of days or a matter of years while the debts are accumulating. Anger or frustration. This is something that is a very, very common, I know it's a crazy little photo, but people get mad. And I'm going to just give you a quick example, right? Household stress, you know, partners arguing over money, parents arguing over money. I think everybody's done it at one point or not, but getting upset, getting frustrated, getting frustrated with the calls, getting frustrated with the decisions that maybe we've made, right? So anger is another part of this process. We could have denial, we could have anger. How about this? Anybody connect? Don't say it if you do, right? I feel like I can. I'm going to say it. Depression or anxiety, right? Anxiety, <laughs> that's for me. But uh, problems, the, the thing is, do money problems produce depression or does depression produce money problems, right? It, this is a big one because sometimes if we are facing these concerns, and I just said it a few slides ago, we could actually spend more money or create more unwanted debt. And I mean, with people managing businesses or owning businesses, it can create a lot of stress. So we want to have a plan for that. But again, this is a stage. This is just a stage that we may experience. And sometimes these stages can cause us to make spending decisions we wish we hadn't, uh, unpaid bills, loss of income, things like that. So again, another stage of managing uh, the, the debt grieving process. Yeah, Andrea. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> One thing about that is when people get sad and depressed and or angry about their debt, um, they want to go out and do something because I deserve it. I'm going to go buy a new outfit because I deserve it. And we talk ourselves into making things worse rather than making things better. And this is something that I've seen culturally perpetuate in our um, in our society where I'm going to go spend money on nails and discretionary things that I don't have to have because I feel I'm worth it. I had mm -hmm. someone who was actually evicted from an apartment living with a uh, sibling 
and um, did not have a job and decided to somehow go into debt for a tummy tuck because I needed something to make me feel good. Mm -hmm. All right. So priorities, uh, what you deserve is what you earn and what you uh, can call your own is what you've worked for. So just to go into debt and because you need something to make you feel good means that you need to have some what I would call attitude adjustment to understand I'm going to sacrifice this over here to pay off this so that I can get over get to there you know yeah. um you have to understand that this whole concept of deprivation that I should be able to do this because I'm worth it gets us into more trouble and more debt than anything that I've seen recently yeah, I would agree. And it's one thing I'll add to that. I just want to check the time. One thing I'll add to that is that like, it's not because we're bad at managing money or doing wrong things. It's, it's, we, that's where sometimes when we're talking, we, we said this in the budgeting workshop, like we, we go right to the numbers. We go right to, this is how I should do it. And this is how I should do it. And that in itself could cause stress. I, I, I really swear one of the best things someone could do if they're really trying to reevaluate their debt situation or prepare their debt situation or their credit situation, you know, for a goal, like a business ownership, home ownership, whatever it is, is to sit down and feel like, think about how you look at money and how we spend money and commit, you know, have a plan for communication and have a plan for when we get stressed out, you know, because you're right. Sometimes we do go to that because it does give us that immediate satisfaction but you know that's something we don't want to stop us from reaching our goals it's like a never-ending battle i i really do understand that right but, but i still think it's important to make sure that we're laying all this out you know developing a plan and accepting that situation so it, it, it is what it is people have debt people make mistakes you know sometimes we have it's something derogatory on a credit report and it is what it is but once we accept it and then we make those changes reach out for support and guidance which is why we're doing this workshop today because this is what we do not just us but the our the partners that are on this call today with sbdc and business insight center i mean you're so smart by just you know taking the time to take this so you know we'll accept it and then it's not about being perfect it's about progression right? And having goals, writing them down and staying in check with ourselves. So at this section, first of all, I'll see if there's, I don't know if there's any questions in the chat. If anyone has questions Not right now. Okay, perfect. Any input anyone wants to share appropriate to the topic? <laughs> all right. So let's talk a little bit about creating the mindset. We'll get more into to lo the logistical side, and so, so I just have one slide here, but again, this, this, this really is focusing on debt and defeating these debts. So one thing we want to put out there is, I don't know if anyone's ever done this brain activity before, but looking at money as a tool. So, you know, people can have a lot of it or not a lot of it, but it doesn't mean that this person who has less of it has the worst money situation. It's really about how we're managing it. So any type of income that's coming in, though I know it could be challenging, you know, if we're fully transitioning from, you know, income to a business and not having anything but or generating any income, but any funds that we have come in, we want to make sure that we have a plan for that, right? And how we manage our money affects what's important to us. Having more money isn't necessarily going to resolve any issues or create that happiness. It really isn't unless we have a plan for it. If it's used properly, we can use it to build things, but if it's not, it can cause fr frustration. So the right perspective, we just want to put it out there that it's not about having this big, huge income, right? To make things right. It is, it's great to have a big, huge income if we have a plan, just like I mentioned, but we want to just kind of start there. If we don't have it, let's figure out where we can go. So let's talk about some strategies. So we want to build our plan. Again, we did, we went more into detail in the, um, the budgeting workshop and the credit workshop. But again, what we're going to show you some glimpses of that here. So the five components of the building our plan, we want to set our goal. What do we want to achieve? Is it delinquent debt? Or do I need to get current? Do I need to fix my credit? Do I need to pay my balances down? Um, do I, you know, maybe I'm good with that. Maybe I need to save more money or maybe I need to, 
uh, figure out, you know, what it is that I'm trying to do. Maybe I need to purchase a car on top of starting a business or whatnot, right? So write down the goals, build your goals. Excuse me here, I'm fighting something today. Um, budget numbers, look at our income versus expenses and figure out like, what is our, our bottom line? You know, what, how much do I have coming in and what, how much do I need to support my household? That's usually where we start. And we'll get a little bit more into that. What things can I not change? That's number three. So sometimes us as humans, <laughs> when we're looking at spending plans and trying to figure out different strategies, we go right to the things that we can eliminate or reduce. A strategy that we try to implement at CCCS is going right to things that we know we can't change, right? So there maybe there's certain expenses in our budget that like, yeah, I could reduce it, but I don't want to. Maybe that's saving for college. Maybe that's an activity for our kids. Maybe it's something you love doing, right? And you're like, I can't not have that. So let me look at everything else. Then you can start working on reducing things, but that might be uh, a place to start and then reevaluating if necessary. Step four is creating an action list. This is kind of if you meet with someone one-on-one -on -one in our agency, by the way, this is what they'll walk you through too, but as an action plan, like start, like where, where do I start writing down? Do I pull a credit report? Do I look at my bank statements? Do I, you know, get my credit card statements together? Do I open the mail I haven't been wanting to look at? Do I, you know, pull in my spouse or partner to look at these together, you know, create that list and then the step five is like, if I'm managing things and I feel like things aren't working, what am I going to do? Am I going to contact a credit counselor? Am I going to contact, um, you know, am I going to look at a consolidation loan? Like, what am I going to do um, to, to build that plan? So the, those are the five components. When it comes to creating goals, we want to create goals that are in line with our values. Our values are things that are like fundamentally important to us. And you've probably have heard this before, but it can give us more motivation to stick to those and, you know, being mindful about those. I know someone told me once, sit down, like take five minutes every morning, just have five quiet minutes. If you like to drink coffee or tea or whatever, get a, you know, a notepad and a pencil or however you like to do things. And just start writing what your goals are for the day. And then it kind of, are they coinciding with our values? Are they coinciding with our financial goals? You know, things to kind of look at, right? So create those goals. And then when we're trying to monetize those, to turn them into, you know, money to save for something, like, what is it? What is the goal? What is the achievement amount? What is the time frame? So that might mean if I'm trying to have a goal of, you know, paying off a $2,400 collection bill and I give myself a year to do it, that means it's $200 a month. That means it's $100 every other week. That means it's $50 each week. Do you know what I mean? Just breaking things down, having, you know, and making it real. There's annual credit report. If the goal is debt related, which a lot of times we see that, of course, um, annual credit report is the spot to go to, to pull your actual report and get your numbers there. We talked a bit about the budgeting piece, right? So we, so we're like, all right, let me see where I stand. So this is whether we're in debt, whether we're not in debt, you're looking to start a business, you just got to get everything together. Where do I stand now financially? How much do I take in? Am I going to keep taking that income in while I'm starting a business? Is there another you know, source of income coming into the household? And how much do we need to support this household? And looking at everything. And then thinking about you know, if I am transitioning into no income for or reduced income until my business sets, like what other expenses do I need to incur? Thinking about insurances, medical insurances, medical expenses, right? Just keeping those organized, look at that budget and do that comparison. So in this budget, I hate this because it looks, it's not, these numbers aren't really current, but um, it still works. I have to redo it, but I, uh, it's just saying how much money I have coming in and how much do I have going out? You could see in this example, they have more money going out than they have coming in. Do you know most people would stop right here and be completely intimidated and deterred from progressing at their financial goals or creating those financial goals? 
no, we don't want to do that. We want to look at this and try to turn it into something that's going to work for us. The positives of this scenario is there's an income coming in, right? The positives of this scenario is they know what they're spending. So let's start here. Another example, again, generic one, but is to keep track. You know, you could keep track on your phone. There's apps. There's a bunch of them. There's like the mint.com. There's another one. You need a budget. You know, it just kind of keeps track. You could go to your bank or your credit union. I bet they have things you can use to track where your money's going. You can be really brave and you could go to your prime account <laughs> and, and, and look, Amazon prime. I'm just joking, but, and see all the, you know, what orders we've had over the past year. If you really feel like you want to know where your money's going and then just keep track. But like, what do I need? Because, you know, you know, the big thing right now, and you know what it is, it's like the groceries and the transportation. And Gina said it earlier, like underestimating what we need. It's, it's human nature to underestimate even what we need for things like groceries, you know, and that's a big one right now with inflation. So making sure that <coughs> we know what we need so we can create a good solid budget, especially if we're talking about defeating debt. Yes, Gina. Oh, you're on mute. You're muted. Gina, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. No, I think this is an important point. Steve Kosovo, who's a federal uh, economist, he works in the high echelons of the economy, uh, was on a talk show that I listened to, and he pointed out something that was very telling. We think inflation is like at 8%, but that's averaged across all industries, right? The top three things we need are gas to get to work, we need food, and we need housing. When you only take those three things and look at the inflation rate, it's more like 21.3%. Wow. Think about that. Groceries and gasoline have gone up so exponentially that the reality of the inflation rate against our budget is 21.3% at that point. Now they say inflation is, you know, 8%, 9%, whatever they say it is, super high anyway. But the bottom line is, is that's cutting across all industries and all kinds of things, including, you know, clothing and entertainment and so on. But, you know, in these times, it means that we will sacrifice something. Um, for example, our my rent went up $30 a month, usually $5 a month went up $30 a month. That was 300, you know, that was huge for mm -hmm. us. So what did we have to do? We got rid of Hulu because that was 29 bucks a month or something. So we had to sacrifice something because something else costs more. A lot of people aren't willing to do that. It also means that instead of going to JCPenney to buy something new, I'll go to Goodwill. In fact, I usually go to Goodwill for clothes because that's where I get the best Cold Water Creek, Liz Claiborne, and other products that are, you know, much more, much easier. And I can refresh them to be my own. So we do, it's mindset. It's it's where's our money going? How can we alter what we're spending it on? And quite honestly, I had a daughter that was, mom, I don't know what we're doing, but it seems like we never have any money left over at the end of the month. And I said, well, let's, we did exactly this. We sat down. We tracked her expenses. She was going to Dunkin' Donut every single day, <laughs> all right? And that was $3.69 a day. And so when I multiplied that times the number of days that she was doing that, I said, this is why you don't have any money at the end of the week. You don't need to drive there. Buy Dunkin' Donut coffee, make it at home, put it in a mug and take it to work. You don't need to give Dunkin' Donut more profits. So it's really taking a look at these it, my dad used to have a saying said, take care of the pennies and the dollars will take care of themselves. And it holds true today as it did when he was raising me. So we really have to think about how we don't take it personally, like, oh, I'm so deprived. I can't have my Dunkin' Donut coffee. No, you're trading one behavior for another to get out of debt and to have more money in your pocket instead of somebody else's. Yeah, thank you so much. It's true. It's true. It's definitely, especially with that inflation. I didn't realize that's a huge 21% is a is huge, you know, definitely increasing. So it's it's important to monitor those type of expenses because it could ultimately lead us down that path without re without recognizing it. Nobody wakes up today and says, Hey, I feel like being in debt. The, you know, these things happen. There's all of these things that could be, you know, out of our control, but within our control too. Right. So there's two ways to resolve that. Right. We either can make more money or spend less money. That's the that's the truth. I wish there was more. But if we do feel overwhelmed, we got to reevaluate. And then this is just an um, 
again, I, I, I like it because it's descriptive, but I don't like it because I know the numbers aren't really up to par. But if you go through, you know, a few things where someone was able to now up their income a little and they reduce some of their expenses, they actually have a surplus, you know, versus negative. So we address the mind, we address the logistics, you know, and then we're going to address the debt. So this is kind of the, the, the way to do that. I see something in the chat. good so creating a visual so meaning that we want to have um something we could look at to kind of keep it all organized whatever works best for you sometimes people like excel spreadsheets or um a calendar like a manual calendar where everything's written out but this is a, a calendar this is just an example again i know it's not like the fanciest looking thing but it works you just take a calendar and you write down, you know, when things are due on it, you could, you put it on your Outlook calendar just so you know, or, uh, you know, whatever works best for you. I know, I think we might have some resources on our website. They might have to be updated as far as the year, but I know that there is some kind of an Excel spreadsheet, which I loved. So I'll see if I could find that. You know, but um, I the, do and, this every what? month, Andrea. Do you? Yeah. I have a whiteboard in the kitchen uh -huh. and every month I, I set up the new calendar I put when the money's coming in, what key payments are due, and then I have an Excel spreadsheet that I keep up at the end of every week just to make sure that we're on track. That's great. I mean, it, it, it is. It's just like keeping track of everything. Well, like even... I think the important thing is, is that these aren't just academic things that you're showing us. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to state this is real stuff that people do if they want to get a handle on their finances. Yeah. You know, that's good. That's funny that you say that because some, sometimes over the years, I will, you know, say that when clients come in, we've had people with like these really, really, I'm not saying, you know, that's good or bad, but just super elaborate Excel and they keep track of everything, which I was always super impressed by, but the bottom line was still the bottom line, <laughs> you know, and we really, you know, so it depends on your personality. If you love to do that and you're capable of it and it helps you great. But as long as we have some kind of calendar method, so we know when money's coming in and what expenses we have going out. And I'll tell you, like, I know a lot of this might seem, you know, elementary, but for it, it it's a missed concept, just keeping things in order, especially when we want to start operating our own business, you know, keeping control of our personal finances can make us so much more successful at managing our business and having resources to, to do that because we can look at things simplified. We can stay mindful. That's a, those are two big concepts concepts that are very easily missed, but also easily filtered in to where we can do things like this. So in this example, it's just a calendar. You know, you write down your pay dates. Um, you can make them recurring if, you, if you're doing this on an Outlook form. And then you can make anything recurring. Like when is your rent due? And then even like organizing your groceries, you know, maybe you go once a month, maybe you go every week, but how much do you need each week or however often you go? right? Because what can happen is we could have a lot, we could have a decent amount of money in our bank account, but think we have more because we're not accounting for all of the expenses and then end up short at the end of the month or week. So just something to think about. So when it, let's talk about the debt. <laughs> okay. So now we talked about the gold, we went through everything. So when it comes to the debt, like know what type of debt you're dealing with, unsecured debt. So maybe we know what unsecured debt is, but I will tell you, unsecured debt is something that if I don't pay, they're not going to come and take something away from me, right? That's, it could be a credit card. Well, they'll take the, the line of credit away, but the, you know, the credit card, a charge card, an overdraft account. You ever wonder why they charge a lot more interest? That's because it's not secured. So is, it, is this the type of debt that I'm dealing with that I want to get paid off? whether it's causing me a problem or maybe I just want to try to resolve it prior to, you know, opening up a business or starting a business, start there. Another category is secured debt. Is this the kind of debt I'm dealing with? Is it my mortgage debt, my auto loan? Not, you know, even if we're, you know, if we're dealing, if it's delinquent or non-delinquent, we should take a form and write it all down. How much debt do I have in this area? How much debt do I have in this area? How much debt do I have in non-interest? That could be a problem for someone. Maybe there's medical debts. That's a big problem for a lot of people. Uh, collection accounts, a judgment, meaning the debt went legal, you know, past due utilities, past due old cell phone, old library, old stuff like that. That's just hanging around in the credit report. If you have that, call me, please. Okay. And if you're trying to figure out how to resolve those, please reach out to us because we can give you a really great um, session 
a lot of information, help you develop a plan, all of that, any of this really. Um, maybe it's non-dischargeable debt. Maybe my big burden is the student loan debt, taxes, child support. Whether it's a burden or not, write it down somewhere, type it in somewhere, know where you stand with it, right? Um, and then find the total so that you know where you stand with all of your debt and we can have a plan for resolving it, getting current, or even if you're in good shape, where do I stand? Because we need to know this type of stuff before we start or, or even not just before we start our business, but while we're managing it, right? Especially before we start. Can I do it on my own? So we, we talked about the budget, right? So once you look at all your credit or debt, you know, you could call your credit card companies and see if they would be willing to lower your interest rate. The worst thing they could do is say no. You're probably not going to have as much luck with like the retail accounts, but you may have some with like, you know, a larger, like a Visa, a MasterCard, but you want to look at it. I, how much do you think is the highest interest rate? Here's a chat question, keeping you interactive, right? What is the highest interest rate someone can receive on a credit card? Type in what you think the answer is. <laughs> no, that was fast. That was <laughs> Let's see what we got. 30, look at that, 29, 19. Yeah. So you're all right, 29. Isn't that crazy? So you can receive really high credit credit um, interest up to 30%, sometimes higher. It all really depends on where the credit card company is, is coming out of. If you look at a lot of your credit card statements, you'll notice a lot of them aren't of out of New York State um, because we're capped at like, I the last I checked, please, I hope I'm not saying this wrong. The last I checked, we were capped at like 18.9% which is high, but it's not 30% either. But if you look at your credit card statements, that, so that means if, by the way, if the company you're doing business with is out of New York State, if it's like a credit union or, um, you know, a, a, a loan, things like that, if they, that's where they're out of, that that's the highest rate they could charge. But you'll notice that a lot of credit card statements, they're not out of New York State, they're out of other states and they're, the limits can be a lot higher. So it really just depends on where it's coming from. Yes, they are, Jennifer, <laughs> the big ones. There's Delaware, there is, uh, where else? Is it Maryland? There's a lot of them in Maryland. Citibank's headquartered in South Dakota, of all places. Yeah, so it's interesting. Um, so you can call them. You can see if they'd be willing to lower it. Um, if they're current, sometimes people say, well, can I settle a debt? So if you settle a debt, that means you're paying less than what you owe on it. And it's usually done on delinquent debt. It's usually done on older debt, like that's been hanging around for some time. So it depends, but I definitely wouldn't settle anything that's current. I don't even know if they would give you that option. Balance transfers. So we could have a lot of balance transfers conversations because is it bad to transfer a balance to get a lower interest rate? No, the concept is, is there and you get a lower interest rate. Here's the question you got to ask yourself. Remember I said it earlier, how long have I been paying this debt? What is the current rate going to be? Is there a balance transfer fee? Is it going to make me feel secure to where I don't, I use more money, I spend more money? That's because you have low interest rates. That's sometimes I, we could have low interest rates and a good credit score. And that's all people base them in a good financial position. Yeah, that's great. Those are great concepts, but how much debt do I have? How, when am I spending money? You know, am I, am I, is there, are we not have a, you know, an efficient savings account, the type of things. So ask yourself those type of questions, you know, when it comes to transferring those balances, how many times have I already done this to pay that same balance? That's all <laughs> with that. Avoid trading unsecured debt for secured. Well, avoid is probably a strong term because sometimes that could be a good option. You know, you know, some people might take out a loan at a lower interest rate to pay something off, but questions you want to ask yourself before you do that. Have I done this before? W will I stop using the credit for sure? Will it put any of my assets at risk? You know, can I, have I investigated all options prior to doing that? You know what I mean? So just things we want to think about something else that's not in here. Sometimes people will take out retirement and start paying off their balances. No, not a good idea, <laughs> please. I might have thought like 20 years ago, like, yeah, that's, that's okay. I'll catch up. Not anymore. You know, definitely something we want to really, you know, be aware of. And you might say, of course, you know, that wouldn't do that. It's a very common scenario, you know, well, very Andrea, common. Andrea, not for nothing, those, those 
you know, retirement loan that you can take can be at 4%. Mm -hmm. And so as long as you have a plan on how you're going to pay it back, so what are you saving by doing it? Mm -hmm. And how much more can you pay? So as long as you're paying it off within a certain period of time and you have a plan for that, borrowing from your retirement is not a bad option so long as you can be disciplined to get it paid off at the much lower interest rate is, you know, can be beneficial. Right. Well, no, yeah, no, no, understand how it works and, and thinking about also your future, you know, earnings, because we've had situations that, that, I mean, that could work, but if someone lost their job or something like that, now they're kind of off key, you know, so just something just to think about. Um, and then for miscellaneous, pay monthly on smaller balances, negotiate settlements on larger balances, take action to avoid judgments. So before things go legal. So calculate your time frame, divide your um, monthly payment, you know, figure out how long it would take to pay off those debts. You know, is it more than five years and what's the cost? Like, what kind of interest am I receiving? It's not just about the monthly payments, but like how much by the time I'm done paying it in five years, how much interest would I would have, would I, should I have paid or did I pay? So here's a few ways to accelerate your repayment. An avalanche method, which is pretty much out there, you may have heard that. So this helps, this is where you would take, <coughs> you would pay everybody their minimum payment. And then say you're, you're at the end of the budget and you're like, okay, I have $100 a month, I could pay extra on these debts. This is where you would take that $100 and pay off the, pay it toward the highest interest account right? And a snowball method is the same things, but the same idea where you have the uh, leftover, say that same $100, but you pay off the lower balance first. You know what I mean? You pay those off until you get down to one. It really depends on the situation for the individual. It depends on the kind of interest rates they're getting on their accounts. It really just depends on what's going to work best for them, right? But these are just some two strategies to help accelerate that repayment instead of setting a little bit of extra to everybody, focus on one creditor, whether it be the highest, you know, pay everybody their minimum, but whether it's the highest interest rate or the lowest balance and kind of work our way up from there. So those are a few strategies, you know, people do have creditor debt. We're not trying to make this a good, bad thing. We just want to make sure that it's something to um, help us to accelerate our lives, to reduce our stress, to help us, you know, build better things. And if you do need that assistance or support, our agency, you know, we're, we partner with a ton of different agencies, including the ones on the call today, um, to help people full spectrum. So our counselors are available from Monday through Thursday from eight until eight and Fridays from eight until five. These are the different services that we offer. We do budget and credit counseling. There's debt manager programs to help people consolidate their creditor debts, uh, first time home buyer programs and education, foreclosure prevention counseling. Um, if people are in a situation to where they're you know, overwhelmed with their mortgage payments, uh, reverse mortgage counseling, bankruptcy counseling. And then, like I said, we do have that specialized counseling for people who are small business owners to really help them um, get things organized and stay on track. Sessions are booked for about an hour. And we look at our goals, we look at our budget, we look at the plan, and just really try to help craft solutions to meet those goals and stay on track there. And at the very least, you'll feel organized and in control. Another service that we offer, this is something that started in 2020, 2019, 2020, is financial empowerment counseling. So these counselors, this is actually in partnership with the city of Rochester and the Centers for Financial Empowerment. It's a newer concept. So if you're interested in things like this or learning more about it, you can always reach out to us. You could Google financial empowerment counseling if you want to get the real deep in on it, but it's where financial counselors are located in different agencies throughout Rochester. And they provide one-on-one -on -one financial counseling as a public service in partnership with the city. And it's not just about debt. Debt could be one of the concerns, credit, credit scoring, but also not, you know, banking. Having a bank account is, is essential. I'm going to just say, you know, especially for people who are looking to start a business or operate a business, it's, it's key and it's key to really being successful, but sometimes we're stopped. You know, maybe there's a, we don't want a bank account or there's reasons we can't open up one. If you're feeling that way, please meet with one of our, our counselors. We can help, 
you know, explain things, help, you know, get you connected or, you know, develop that savings or whatnot, questions to ask when opening an account, things like that, um, and making sure we're utilizing an account appropriately, improving savings, identity theft prevention, prevention, everything. So this is a whole, again, once a full spectrum type of counseling. And I think I'm kind of early. I think I meant like, it's only 11. But um, here's our email. Here's our phone number. Um, here's some resources. So I see a few chats, but maybe we could open it up for discussion at this point. Yeah. Andrea, if I could address the business owners, um, during the pandemic, uh, we certainly saw a lot of suffering businesses. The primary business that I saw were hair salons, where they, did, where they skin money off the top. They didn't save anything. They maximized all their deductions so that they never had to pay taxes and uh, did, not, did no savings. So when this pandemic hit and the salons were shut down, they were SOL, if you know what that means. They had no, they couldn't get PPP. They didn't qualify for economic injury disaster loan because their tax returns showed negative all the time. So if you're a business owner, you need to have a strategic plan for saving money and having money in the bank for that disaster, whether it's to move your business, um, whether it's to get yourself out of town, whatever it may be. But just remember that, you know, taking your cash off the top, never paying taxes may seem like a short term good problem, but you're never adding to your Social Security or pension or a self-employment pension. Um, these are these have long consequences <laughs> that are very much uh, very deep. And we saw so many people go out of business because they had no cash savings. They had no disaster plan. They had uh, nothing but that short term. I don't have to pay taxes this year. And it, it was consequential. There were so many people that lost everything that they had worked for because of these short term uh, philosophies of how they did business. My best advice is that disasters will always come, whether it's a pandemic, a hurricane, a snowfall, an ice storm, whatever it is, get money in the bank, leave it alone, invest it a little bit if you can, but make it liquid and be prepared for when something might happen. It could be the entire block where your building is, um, a transformer blows and it's going to be a month and a half before you can actually be in business again. So anything can happen at any time, learning how to save, learning how the, to know the difference between needs and wants, Take care of the, the needs first, the wants can come later and get some money in, in the bank. And even the smallest amounts can add up to be something. Um, you know, I think I shared with people on the last one that I've been collecting, you know, returnable bottles like a, like a mad woman. And I've been throwing it into this jar. I didn't think there was that much money in it, but when I took it to the bank and cashed it in, it was like $85. It just had accumulated and I took all that money and I put it on a credit card balance. So there's lots of ways to generate things, um, whether you do side gigs, side hustles, Instacart, whatever, just make sure that you've got more money coming in than you have going out and be sure to set money aside for that rainy day. Is Instacart, I should know this, but I don't, like when you do Instacart and is that, are you a contract worker? Is that- Yeah, you're not... a contract worker. So you will get a 1099 at the end of the year, but you get paid right away. So if you have the app and you go and do the shop, you, you deliver it and you can get a tip, you know, you can make $50 like in, in, a, in an hour, you could make $50. Okay. Now, yes, you're going to have to have your, you know, that would require a self-employment tax. So you need to set a little money aside for that. But the bottom line is, is that there are so many ways today to do side gigs that are going to generate some extra income so that you can, I mean, I think. Uh, someone at, uh, I think it's Angela Rollins is doing uh, pet sitting yeah, on the weekends is. and they're, you know, it's a big deal and it's a big thing so that they can take that money and set it aside for, you know, for buying a house or whatever. So there's lots of ways. And with the internet today and all the online things you can do, um, getting a side gig going and making some extra money should not be that challenging. Yeah. And you get a lot of steps in. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of steps in with dog dog sitting for sure. Yeah, for sure, for sure. But I I put our link in our um 
in the chat box. So if people have questions or they want to get connected, please feel free to investigate that if you would like that type of counseling. Uh, Gina, do you want to talk about December's topic quickly? I would love to talk about December's topic. Uh, December is going to have a focus. Uh, first off, the, the December seventh date, that's uh, the first Wednesday in December, is going to be focused on retailers. And what we're focused on is a program called Holiday Sales Push to the Finish, 12 Strategies to Finish Strong for the Holiday Season. And this is going to be with the remaining weeks of the holiday season, which would be about 18 days from that point. Retailers need to embrace every remaining day to capture their in-store and their um, online sales. In fact, the National Retail Federation reported that in-store retail sales are expected to grow 10.5% this year, which I'm not sure is inflation related or more customers coming in to buy, but the online sales are scheduled for 13.54%. So with that, uh, you know, the, the report pointed out with online sales that employers need to have a mobile app that's accessible to their product. In fact, last year, 67% of all online sales were done with a mobile phone. So we're going to talk about that and strategies that you can use to, to really finish strong in the holiday season. We want you to capture uh, these sales by focusing uh, following through and with timely execution of these 12 strategies. And uh, so we'll look forward to seeing you on December 7th uh, with the Business Insights Center to really help you finish strong in the holiday season. That's awesome. And then Jennifer put in there too that I didn't realize this. In January, we'll have financial counselors at Central Library the first Friday of the month from nine to five. So you have access to that as well. Yeah, that's a great service. Even if you think you're in good shape, there are so many things that they can talk about that you may not have known or was possible. You know, people just, you don't know what you don't know. So it's good to have a conversation. It's free. So you might as well go and sit down for an hour and see, maybe it's validation. Mm -hmm. Looks like we're doing okay. Or maybe there's some pointers they could give you that are going to make things even better. Excuse me. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I don't know if there's any, anything else anybody wants to add, but I appreciate everyone attending and thank you to our partners for organizing this. Always glad to present. Um, and I think we're good on, on my end. Yeah. Jennifer, do you want to talk about um, how they can see this uh, in the other two parts? Oh, in the uh, YouTube. I put the YouTube link in the beginning of the chat. So you have that there um right here youtube channel um i'll do that again so yeah if you want to copy and paste that into your browser uh we have other programs on there as well um besides first wednesdays we have our um cannabis industry meetup uh meetings on there and um some other um investment related uh programs so feel free to check it out awesome Perfect. great program andrea thank you so much yeah thank, thank you. you everyone thanks for attending and thank hopefully you. we'll see you next month yeah looking forward to it bye thanks bye-bye